Why don't we just start first by I'm um, just remembering what we did yesterday. It was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So I feel like me, I have to be reminded of what we do. Okay, so why don't you just take a couple of minutes to look at your notes and then you can tell me some of the key things that you felt either spoke to you or you remember or whatever. So why don't just take a couple of minutes to look through your notes and then we'll follow up. create the learning environment and the environment that's conducive, fantastic. And that's really what we want to talk about. Okay, anyone else? Can you share about that every uh, classroom has a teacher and every uh -huh. teacher is a teacher to Great, yeah, absolutely fantastic. I can meet anyone. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Even me. <laughs> Even me. <laughs> Yeah, it, is the first step into the yeah. So much more marriages don't last very long if, if they don't go beyond. That was a wonderful wedding ceremony, you know. Yeah. It, it, because that's not that's not what it's all about. Exactly, and it's the same the same with our faith. If, if all we focus on is salvation, we don't, that's not what it's about, and we you know, we'll be frustrated inevitably. Let me just, on that, let me just share one thing that was helpful to me and was a revelation to me, because I kind of walk, my, my idea was, you know, if you see how close you can get to the edge as you walk along the cliff. And I used to do that physically too, you know. You know, we'd go bushwalking and I'd be walking along the edge seeing how close I could get to the edge of the cliff. Well, I slipped one day. <laughs> and my, and I got um, stuff in my leg. But that's the trouble, you see, there's two issues. If you're walking along, seeing how close you can get to the edge of the cliff, you know. What do you, what's the minimum you have to do? One problem is you can slip and fall if you're walking that close, it can be dangerous. And so you can you can slip and you can fall over because of the influences that you're allowing into your life, people and stuff, and we all know people who have done that. The other problem is this. You may think you're walking on the edge of the cliff, but you don't know, the cliff may actually be over here. <laughs> Because you, know, you, you may think, well, I've got it all sussed, I've got it all worked out, and this is where the cliff is, but you may be deluded. <laughs> and that may not actually be where the cliff is. So for me, yeah. what I came to the conclusion was, the safest thing to do was to run towards God. Okay, away from the cliff, away from the edge. Because that's the safe place. And it's also the place of enjoyment. It's the place of, of, of um, it's where, where life is full and life is enjoyable. When you're sitting here going, well, can I have a glass, another glass of beer or wine? Or can I, mm -hmm. you know, how, how far can I go with this guy or girl? And, you know, how, you know, you're sitting here always trying to work all of these things out. That's a miserable place to be. <laughs> okay? It really is. It's miserable. You know, trying to, you know, you, you can't enjoy running away from God and you can't enjoy God either. And you're sitting there always trying to work it out. And that's that's not a that's not a healthy place to be either. It's not a fun place. It's a it's a miserable place. So mm. I I would say run towards God, <laughs> and that's a much healthier. Are so you talking about life in general? Yeah, um, life in general. Um, yes, love life. So. Yeah, it's life in general. But see, it's lovely life. Life lived God's way. See, He's created us. See, God's a crea created us, and it's like I have a. So I bought myself a brand new, I don't know what car, for me a Ferrari was always the one. You're a Ferrari, that was the one, you know, a nice red Ferrari was I thought, yeah, that'd be, I'll have made it when I get my Ferrari, you know, growing up. Um, I had friends who had Ferrari, I went to a wealthy school, I had friends who had, you know, 
and, and cars and uh, you know, anyway. So that was my. I thought if I got a Ferrari, then that would be that. You know, that would be it. Um, but you know, if if I got a Ferrari and I didn't bother reading the manual, and I thought, oh, that paddock there needs to be ploughed. I think I'll just hitch up the old um, plough on the back of my Ferrari, and I'm just going to go out in the paddock and start ploughing the paddock, and then I'm going to do a bit of um, you know paddock bashing, and I you know. You know, it'll, it'll work, okay, and it'll work for probably, you know, maybe a year, two years. After a year or so, you're going to find little bits begin to fall off. You're going on the smooth road. It's not running quite as well as it used to, you, you know, and, and then eventually it's going to fall apart because it wasn't made for all of those things. It was made to go on right, drive very fast on flat roads, and it doesn't really do anything else very well. Okay, if you go on bumpy roads or stony roads or gravel roads, it can work, but it doesn't do that very well because that's not what it was made for. And so it's like that. See, we have a rule book, which is the Bible. Well, no, it's not a rule book. It's a, it's a manual. It's, a, it's a, the owner's manual saying, this is how I made you to live. And if you live this way, it's going to be great. You know, Ferrari going fast on a, on a track looks absolutely beautiful. Okay? But a, but a Ferrari trying to... You know, plough a field looks absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> do, do you see? And so it's, it, it's like that with us. If we take what God's given us and we use it in a way that it wasn't created to, to be used, it will, it will do okay and, you know, to start with. But then eventually it begins to wear out. It begins to t have telltale signs. You know, the, the relationships begin to fall apart. The, you know, the life begins to not be so glamorous when, you know, what I thought was really cool because I had all these different girlfriends um, as a guy, suddenly I can't maintain a, a loving long-term relationship, you, you, you know, because I'm so used to short-term relationships that are about my fulfillment. Um, and, you know, and so in every area you can say the same thing because if you live, if you don't live the way the, 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 the master or the creator made us and follow his, so, so he's given us a book not to stop us having fun but to show us how to have fun, you see, it's like the Ferrari manual, if you read it properly it tells you how to have fun. We had another friend who had a, an English car, you may not be familiar with it, do any of you know what an MG is? It's a little sports car. They had an MGA, MGB was the, was the normal, like that was the normal little sports car, it's a British sports car, and they made a few MGCs, and in the manual, it says if you're going to go over 120 miles an hour, or kilometres, I can't remember which it was, then you need these spark plugs, and if you're going to do this, but if you use the wrong stuff, it, it doesn't work as well. And see, that's what God's given us a manual, he said, this is how you're to have fun, this is, this is how I created you to enjoy life. Now, you can do it another way, but it's going to bring destruction. And I, you know, I've seen people who, you know, I've got a lot, lot of friends that I grew up with and, you know, I've gone through life with, you know, their lives are falling apart now. You know, I have a friend who's in hospital with, you know, for lots of reasons, their life is a bit miserable. They've got gangrene in their legs because they don't have circulation, because they smoked all their life and because of the lifestyle they chose. And, you know, it's like it, it all catches up because they weren't made to live the way that they chose to live, you know. And I know I'm harping on this a little bit, but I, I, and that's really helpful for people. We have to help children to understand, or whatever age we're working with. It, it, God isn't, a, He doesn't want us to, to not have fun. He wants us to show us how to have fun. You know, how, how to enjoy life, how, to, how we were made to, to you know, have a blast. I, I, I love my life. You know? I don't have to have alcohol to enjoy life. You know, and I, I, it's like I have, I know people, and even on TV, we have some of our, you know, like news reporters and things like that. It's almost like they have to have a, you know, a couple of beers before they feel like they can enjoy life. Uh, I don't need that. I, I enjoy life. Life's great. You know, life's wonderful. I, I, doesn't mean I never have stresses. I have lots of stresses often, <laughs> but I've got someone to go through them with. You see, so. I know I'm harping on. I just feel like this is an important thing for some of you to understand. That God, he, He's not stopping us having fun. He's showing us how to have fun in the way He's created us. Okay? So I'll stop. I'll stop. Um, having fun. I'll stop having fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop having fun. Okay. I'm never going to. I'm not. I'm, life's, life's great. You know? And you know, even, I mean, I've, I've read books of people who end up in, you know, prison for their faith and all of those sorts of things. 
and they enjoy life in prison. You know, you look at Paul, he's having a blast in prison, singing songs to God, worshipping God, telling the other prisoners about Jesus, and then, you know, there's an earthquake because, you know, and the guy's just about to kill him. He says, don't do that, it's okay, we're still here, we didn't go anywhere, we're still having too much fun here, you know, why, why would we want to leave? You know, it's, it's like, it's a big adventure, it's, it's a wonderful adventure with God. Okay, um, any other points from the thing? I, I promise I won't speak so long about any other <laughs> We'll get on to something else. Okay, okay. Well, what, we, what we want to do is I'm going to, we, we looked yesterday at, at Learner Center, so really what, we were just laying a foundation yesterday. We were saying that, you know, in terms of educational theory, you have teacher-centered theories, you have student-centered theories, and in the middle there's learning-centered. learning, learning centered. And, and it's about creating an environment where people learn. It's, help, it's, it's both understanding how people learn, understanding how you teach, and helping them to learn whoever is teaching, and, and learning to teach no matter what your, your audience is like. So it's that combination of working together to create an environment that's learning. It's a partnership. So it's not the teacher who's responsible, it's not the student that's responsible, but it's a partnership of working together within a culture that you create um, to learn. And my goal, would, if I'm in a classroom, would always be that the kids want to learn. Okay? That we want to create an environment where they, you know, it's enjoyable. Maybe hard work, and they may not like hard work, but we, we get to a point where it's enjoyable hard work, and school is fun, enjoyable, it's part of life. Learning is, is, is important, you, you know? And that's what we want. So the kids not finding that, we don't want to chastise them all the time because they're not, you know, they're playing with their whatever, you know, playing with their, you know, they're not concentrating or whatever. We want to work with them and say, okay, how do I, you know, let's work together on this. What's going on? And let's, let's, let's find out what we need to do so that you can enjoy uh, this to at least a level or manage it or, you know, uh, do you need to go for a run every every ten minutes? That's fine. Go and do that, and then come back and settle down. Um, I have a friend who's got a, uh, had a child in the school who has ADHD. Um, they're at a high level and can't can't concentrate for more than five minutes. So he he notices. He keeps his eye on the kid. He's got a list of jobs for him. And as soon as he loses concentration, he says, "Hey, come here. Can you go out and take this to the headmaster?" And he comes back and he sits down. He has some exercise. He can concentrate. Okay, so it's, it's working. How do we create an environment that, that is learning-centered? Because, you know, the reality is we aren't the center of the universe. And that's the problem with child-centered education. They are not the center of the universe. God is. Okay. And we need to know our place within that. And we, we want to cater for everyone to create an environment which God has done. He's created an amazing environment for us to enjoy life amazing environment you know with beauty beautiful things you know you can if we spend all our lives trying to explore all the all the um, stuff that God's put in his world we'll never do it you know we're never going to get bored with the stuff he's put so he creates this environment for us and I think that that's our job as teachers primarily is to create an environment where kids are able to learn and want to learn and yes we need to part of that's instruction part of it's you know there's all sorts of ways we do that um, and so what we want to do now is I just want to talk a little bit um, about a, a foundational piece for this, which is the different way um, where our education that we have today comes from. Okay, if you'll, as I, I probably, I think I mentioned yesterday, I'm, I don't like, I, I, one of my questions, why do we have to sit in the classroom? Now I understand there are some things that sitting down and listening is part of the process or standing up and listening. That's part of learning, being able to write. And so... It's not that I'm anti-classroom, don't hear me that, saying that, but not all the time. There's a place for that and there's a place where it's effective, a classroom, a kitchen table, a, you know. Um, but that, I don't know that that's the best place for everything, to learn everything. Okay, so let's, let's have a look at where, where did our education system come from? Um, who created the curriculum? Now, how do I get a full screen? Oh, there we go. Okay, so we want to look, we want to compare uh, two different models of education. 
and then we want to look at the difference between um, biblical edu Christian education and traditional education. I, don't, I, it's all, I always find it hard to know what works because there's mixtures of both. There's, you know, in many systems of education in many countries, there's some really good stuff and we're getting better and better at it. Um, and yet in some countries, there's lots of really bad stuff. And, so, um, and, and often, in, I mean, even in Christian schools, we always have a mixture because the ideal, you know, there's... Um, in theory, theory is always wonderful. Okay, <laughs> in that, and what I mean by that is theoretic. You know, theory is great. And well, let me put it this way: if if you've got a dream, you know, the best way to keep that dream perfect and to make it the best it can possibly be, and to create the perfect image that you've got in your dream, is never to engage with it and okay, to keep it as a dream. Okay, if you keep it as a dream, it can stay perfect. <laughs> But as soon as you engage with it, it, it's not perfect anymore. You've got to work with reality. You've got to learn. You've got to, you know. And so that's the. That, and so we, I'm giving you the the dream. Do you, do you understand? But reality, um, we've got to work with reality. We've got to work with our, you know, me getting tired and losing my temper with my kids, and you know, my kids getting tired and being ratty. Um, in my perfect world, they don't do that, and I don't react. Do, do, do you? <laughs> However, <laughs> um, I know how to fix it, you see, and that's, that's, that's why the, what the Bible is so beautiful. So if I get, if I, I'm talking about my kids at home, and there's probably no excuse to do it at school, but if I, I end up, you know, I've, I've spoken sharply to my kids, they'll probably tell me anyway, because they know it's wrong. But I go and have to apologize, you see. I go, hey, I'm really sorry, will you forgive me? And they say, we forgive you, Dad. And we pray again and we have a hug and it's right. Do, do, so there's a way to fix it. Um, so, okay, let's, let's look at Hebrew education. So the Hebrew education, this is like biblical, um, Hebrews were the people of the Bible. Um, it's, and we're going to go through a lot of stuff today, okay, so, you know, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but it is fairly theoretical, and we'll try and make it as interesting as possible. If you're falling asleep, just wave at me and we'll do something different, okay? Put on some music. <laughs> Put on some music. <laughs> I'll give you some earplugs so you can go to sleep easier. <laughs> um, okay, so the Hebrew model, the biblical model, it was based on the Ten Commandments, which we know, I hope, and it was based on the Torah. The Torah is the, which I'm not pronouncing right, it's, hey, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Thank you for coming to our class. Um, the t first five books of the Bible is the Torah, and the and a Hebrew child would have to, at, at least a male child, and often the females would involve themselves in the process too, depending on parents. They would have to learn large chunks of those first five books. Some people would say they had to learn the first five books of the Bible in totality by the age of about 13. Okay, so they would learn large, memorize large chunks of the Bible. And then if we look at the Shema, which is the next... Um, um, why don't we read this together? Have you, have you looked at this at all? It's, a, it's one of the great scriptures in the Bible about education. So why don't we read this together? Okay? One, two, three. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love of the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. And bless upon your children. Talk about them when you sit alone, when you walk along the roads, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. What's wrong? You know? Yeah, oh, there. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going too fast, am I? <laughs> okay, okay, we go again. Okay, we start from out here. We start, yes. talk. We start talking. Okay. 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 Talk, talk about, about them when, when you sit at home, home and when you walk along the road, road when you lie down, down and when you get up. I them as symbols on your hands, and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses, and on your gates. Okay. So, in this Old Testament scripture, what are we to love the Lord our God with? Hi, hi. Hi. What is it? Hi, your heart. How? Or your heart? Hi. No. Mind. So, no. Oh. 
God. Look at the look at the scripture. <laughs> I soul, 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 and strength, and strength, and, strength. and, strength. and commandments. No. Okay, so yeah. those are the three things, and you picked up. There's something added which we'll talk about in a why in the New Testament. What is added in the New Testament? No, we'll look at it later. We did mention it. <laughs> So you were quoting the New Testament, oh, yeah. quoting of this. So what did you add? What did you add? Mine. Mine. Okay. And we'll talk about that, why that is included, or why I think it's included. That's only in the New Testament. It's not in the Old Testament. Okay. But Jesus adds that in, which is interesting. So we'll look at why that would be. So. Now, I love this scripture because this is sort of a methodology piece in some ways. It's like this is, so what they learnt was the, the Shema or the first five books of the Bible and the Ten Commandments. But this talks about how they learnt. Okay, so what, how were they, what sort of things were they to do in terms of their learning? Talk about it. Talk about they were to talk about it. Okay. Yep. What else were they meant to do? Um, when when, when were they meant to talk about it? Walking. Okay, so walking. At home. Home. They lie down. Lying down. And they get up. Put it into action, like uh, use the symbols. Okay, so then they've got visual, so they've got to see it. Yeah. Okay. When they uh, before they go to sleep. Yeah. And when, when they wake up in the morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and then there's only so so it's interesting. I don't know whether you've looked at the learning styles, the modalities. Do you know what they are? Like visual, auditory, oh, kinesthetic. Yeah. Okay, so, see, in this methodology piece, God knew how he created us, mm. long before the, you know, the theoreticians. <laughs> um, oh. Oh. Yep, the brakes work. Okay. <laughs> okay, so even before, you know, it had all come, we've got a theory about learning, God knew how he, he made us. So what, what sort of things are auditory there? What does he say that, that, that would minister to people who are auditory? Talk. 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 Yes. talk, but not just talk, discuss, you see, you talk about it when you're walking, see when you're walking on the road, they're not talking at, it's a, it's a dialogue, you know, it's, a, it's an interaction, it's like what we do at dinner table, yeah. you, you know, it's that, it's when you sit down, so when we sit down at dinner, we talk about it, okay? when we jump in the car, we talk about it, you know, so it's life, while we're doing life, we're talking about, and it's it's when things come up. It's answering questions. It's it's not so they do the memorizing by themselves, but talking about it is how do we apply that? You know, what does it mean to do tithing? What does it mean to you know? Why do we have to go outside the camp to, to our business? Why can't we just do it at home? You know, can't we dig a hole there? And that's, so you know, so why? You know, so all of that so the dialogue is is the process of teaching. Okay. And a visual. So, what do they do for the visual people? Um, um, symbols. Yeah, symbols. Where? On the forehead. So they tie symbols, so they've always got it on them. And what else do they do? Write it on their door frames. So they write, yeah. write the scriptures on the door frames and on the gates. Okay. So there's a visual. It caters for the visual people. There's memories of. Oh yeah, I remember. I've got to. You know, I've got to do that. Okay. So it helps them to remember what God's saying, what they're learning. And so, what about for the kinesthetic people? What is, what is he, well, how are they catered for? They move around. Yeah. Yeah, so but what, what in here? What is, how does God say to cater to them? So he caters for them even in the scripture. Simple. Um, well, as they're walking. Yeah, when they're walking. So he says, don't just, yeah. don't just sit at home and talk about it. Yeah. Get up and walk around. When you're walking talk, and talking, you talk about it. So he caters for everyone. Every, everyone the way. So all the different ways we learn, he's in this one scripture, he's included them. Isn't that neat? Yeah. yeah. And so their whole methodology was not about me as the teacher teaching you. It was about us together learning. You see, creating an environment of learning. So that's what we try to do at home. See, it's not... It's not um, Sitting around the table at dinner time, why we do that is because it becomes a learning environment. Is it every night that we have long discussion? No, but a lot of them we do. You know, their kids are older, they're you know, 18 to 24, so uh, you know, they have, we, we often talk about all sorts of things. You know, we start about how did your day go and what have you done and then they'll talk and then they might talk about, I don't know, 
whatever, and then we'll have some input and we have interaction and, and we're learning together. We're learning how to do life as Christian people. We're learning how to interpret the handbook. You know, how do we interpret that handbook so that we have lots of life? You know, how, how, do we, how do we create? And so that's what these guys did. It's called a, a, a tech, a, it's sort of a, a didactic process, which is, you know, they often ask questions and, and get answers. And it's a, it's a very interactive process. Um, and the Greeks had a similar sort of process when they started, um, but then it was formalized. We'll, we'll look at that in a little bit. But I love the scripture because it's, it, it gives us such a wonderful model of, of creating an environment of learning that's not just based in a classroom, it's based in life. And for me, that's what um, is really important. You know, if what we learn doesn't have relevance to our life, why are we learning? You know, it doesn't have to have relevance today, but, but why are we learning? And it may be that there's relevance because it's teaching us to think, it may have relevance for lots of reasons, but, you know, it may be that we're learning to learn. <laughs> but we want to talk about the relevance. We want to talk about why that, you know, why is that the case? You know, what, as I say, you know, we might talk about why, why is it wrong for gays? Why can't gays get married? Why do you, you know, they, they know that I don't think that's necessarily a good idea. So, you know, they've had discussions with their friends and they'll come back and they'll say to me, that's all we'll have dinner. So why, why is it wrong? Okay, help me. What, what's, what's going on? Why doesn't God love them? Yeah, so we talk about, you know, what the difference between um, loving the person and loving the actions. Um, and, and we talk about, so have, you, have, have there been times for you where you felt like, we, you know, we, have you always felt we love you? Yes, we always know that. And so we talk about what, how they know. We always know you're accepted by us. You know, whatever you do, we always cause we talk about that. You know? But, but sometimes do you do things that we don't like you doing, and you know that. Yeah. You know, so we talk, so that, that, that's a three second conversation now, but that might have taken an hour you know, mm -hmm. to, to unpack that and dialogue that and, and work it all out. Okay. So they're creating their value system. I can't insist they agree with me, but we, we can talk and dialogue, and we'll talk about how that works. Okay, any questions as we go on? Okay, so by the age of 13, the Hebrew boys had memorized the Torah, um, and education was based on applying that law in all areas of life. So, that, so it's a discussion point about how do we apply this law to life. And education was the responsibility of the family that was carried out in the home. Okay, so all of this was, when I say it was carried out in the home, it was also carried out in the community and the synagogue. So it was a, you know, that scripture that we looked at, So in the scripture, um, oh sorry, I lost my train of thought. Got carried away with all my little. I didn't realise all my drawing materials. Um, okay. So by the age of thirteen, education was. What was I going to say? Okay. So carried out in the home. Oh, that, that, that scripture was was actually it wasn't written to the parents. It was written to the community of Hebrew people. So when it said hero Israel, it didn't say hero parents. It says hero community. Okay, love the Lord your God with all your heart. You know, talk about the law when you're walking, when you're sitting. So it didn't talk about it in a you know weird as a Western person. It's hard for me to understand community. My community is my nuclear family. I include my parents and grandparents, but it's a fairly small understanding of family. Whereas many other communities have a much broader and much bigger and much better understanding. And so when they said hero Israel, it's talking to the whole family of Israel, which is millions of people. And so it's all of their responsibility to train the children. It's not just so. When I say um, it's carried out by the family and carried out at home, that's in the context of a community of believers who were also involved in the process and also talking. So when you see Jesus um, in the synagogue, uh, talking to the to the to the priest, the the, um, the surprise wasn't that he was there talk, in the temple talking to the priests, because that was like school. The, the surprise was the depth of questions that he had, which were quite amazing. But he was just doing what they normally do, asking questions. That, that was how they learned. That the student would ask questions, the, the the priest would ask questions, and that 
have discussion and dialogue and learn together. Um, and it's kind of a process that the, that they were taken through. Okay. So all all sin, learning, knowing, etc. around God and being his people. And it's understood that if you obeyed God, you'd be blessed, and if you disobeyed God, you would be cursed. Okay. Now, I'm not going to do a lot of this. Um, you can get the PowerPoint if you'd like, because that's not the emphasis this week. Um, I won't go, I'll just go, um, I, basically, um, the Hebrew education went through, they, they didn't have schools until um, about, when was it, 75 BC, was when they had the first, uh, or they had the first tertiary school, um, when they went into exile, they started, they trained the adults, they had the first primary school, um, secondary school, about 75 BC. Um, which was in the temple, and it was, again, all about protecting their culture. And then they didn't have a primary school, a formal primary school, um, until about um, 70 AD, which is when Nero, if you know the history, uh, was, was persecuting the Christians and Jews. And so they were scattered all throughout the known world, and they, didn't, they, they were afraid they'd forget their identity and forget who they were, so they set up um, primary schools based on the Greek model. Okay. So they didn't have, so there wasn't, so when you think of school, I mean, if, if you think about it, um, they didn't have textbooks, they had scrolls, you, you know, so it's a very different idea um, of learning, you know, you, you don't get your exercise book and write stuff in it, there, there was no exercise book, there was no pens, there were no pencils, uh, you know, possibly they had sandboxes, uh, possibly some sort of chalkboard, um, you know, the slate sort of thing. So they may have had those, but they probably were later on. They may have had sandboxes, probably the most likely thing. You know, a box of sand where they could write in the sand. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus wrote in the dirt, it was like him writing on paper. You, you, you know? Yeah. It, it's, it's a similar sort of concept. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, liberal education, which is the Greek model of education, uh, which is where our system comes from. Uh, so, again, let me just reinforce Hebrew model, they had the, the Hebrews had the book of the law. They had the they had the Bible or the Torah and, and other books. So they had and, and this law was absolute and their education and their, their whole process was how do we apply this law to life? Because we already have the law. Now the Greeks, which is where the liberal model of education comes from, that's our current model, the Greeks don't didn't have any absolute truth. They had no law. They had their, what, what are called demigods. So, so we, the Hebrews had this almighty, all-powerful God. The, the Greeks and Romans had what are called demigods. They were sort of half-human. You know, how many of you have seen Thor? Oh, yeah. Thor? So that's based on sort of the Greek-Roman gods. Okay, so they're sort of half, they're more powerful than us, but they're still um, fallible. You know what that means? They still, they still do bad things and good things, and uh, they're not... They're not perfect. They, you know, they they muck up and they make a mess and you know they do all of these, you know. And so their gods were not um, were fallible. They were not um, all powerful. They were not uh, perfect. And so therefore they didn't have any truth. <laughs> they couldn't, you know. So truth didn't come from the gods. Truth came from the agreement of the most people to the strongest argument. Okay. And we'll look at that a little bit later. And that's what we have now. You see, we don't have absolute truth, which is what the Hebrews had. The Bible is truth. And they have, we have, a, as a Christians, we have a concept. There is truth that doesn't change. God's not going to change his mind and say, it's, okay, it's, it's, you know, it's fine for you to steal, it's fine for you to murder. He's not, he's not going to suddenly change his mind. The truth is always the truth. Okay. So the Greeks um, had a different understanding of truth. So that was, that, you've got to understand that to understand the two models of education in, in some ways. The Greeks created an education and was their primary goal was for the elite leaders of their society to be trained. They were the only ones who had the time and the money to go through an education process. And the elite leaders came from the, were the citizens of, of Athens. Now, in ancient Greece, there were two, there were numbers of different city-states, is what they called them. They were like um, a, a city, walled city, that had power and dominion, and then they'd have rural land around that was related to it, um, and that would be like a city-state, and there were a number of these. Uh, 
the, the most well known was uh, probably Sparta and Athens, and they were very different models of governance and education. Anyone seen the movie 300? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that was Sparta. Okay, so they, those guys, they were warriors. Um, from birth, they, the, the children became, um, were owned in, 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 by the state or by the city. The city decided whether they lived or died. If they were weak, the city decided that they would die. And it was all about being strong warriors. Okay, and they were fierce and they were trained like that right from the beginning, men and women together. Well, they weren't allowed to have children until they were 30. Um, so lots of different, I won't go into all the details, but yeah. So if you've seen it, you, you, you understand the concept. But that was fun. Our education didn't come from them. <laughs> they came from Athens. And Athens, although it was also, they, you know, war was part of life there. Um, and so that was a part of it. But they wanted the philosopher ruler, philosopher leader. Um, was what came and so people like Aristotle, uh, Plato, Socrates um, all came from that, from Athens and the Athenian model. And so in, in Athens um, about five to ten, I mean sorry, ten maybe twenty percent of the most of the people in Athens were uh, citizens of Athens, were born in Athens and came from the line, Athenian line, the Athens, the line of Athens. And they were the leaders. They were the ones who owned the land, who owned the, the, you know, were the people of power. They were the ones. And this education system was to train them to lead. And then on top of that, you had about 30 to 40, depending on the time, percent of the population were immigrants. Uh, so they'd immigrated because of their, their, for financial reasons, for safety reasons. They wanted to go to a bigger city where they get more protected. Now, for lots of different reasons, they've immigrated, but they are not. They are they're free. And they would. They took mostly the more management decisions. They couldn't own land. They couldn't own um, things. So they would manage the shops for the citizens. They would. Um, they would do the accounting. They would do uh, the, the trades. Like if they were gifted at trade, um, you know, handicraft, uh, you know, maybe carving or stone masonry. So they they would do all the trades. Um, but they were free and they would get paid for that. Um, you know, they might manage the farm um, or, or have management roles on the, um, on the farm. Then on top of that, you had about 40 to 50% of the population were slaves. They, these were captured in war and they did all the non, um, you know, non, non-skilled jobs. Uh, if they were particularly gifted, they could rise, and you see that in the Bible in different places, they can rise and, and get more um, Higher level jobs. I don't know. Higher level is the wrong word. Uh, more, more perhaps academic or, or other jobs and low skill if they had skills. Uh, but again, they were slaves. So that was how the population. So the Greek model was only to train the elite leaders of that society. And those leaders, if you read some of um, Plato and um, what have you, those leaders um, never did anything. They, they were not. They were not to do. I'm just, um, they were the, the, the leaders of, in this model, they weren't to do anything, they were only to think. So they were trained to think, not do. They had all the immigrants and everyone else did stuff, um, sort of practical stuff. They didn't do any practical stuff. And they, they, their whole philosophy was that they were to be philosopher rulers who thought, argued, discuss, um, and created their, their world through intellectual debate and discussion and things. So they would they would have so they would create beauty but they'd do it through other people. You know, they would be the leader and say, this is what we want you to do. You know, we want an orange grove here, we want it watered, we want so that was their life that was how they lived their life pretty much. Um, I'm sure there were you know different levels of of um, financial means and all of those things. But but the education system was only for that elite leadership group. Now, that, this liberal model, um, it was, there were actually two groups. Um, liberalists, which are suitable for free men, or, or, and that's what we've got to talk, that's where liberal education comes from. It was formalized, uh, so, yeah, we, we, okay, so it was formalized by the Romans, which is why these are um, Latin terms. Uh, but the liberalists, which was for free men, and then servalists, which was for those who served for free men. Okay, and that was the trades, the accounting, the, and so even in our own education systems, 
Well, particularly when I grew up, it's, it's a little more blurred in some countries now. You have this two-tiered system. You have the vocational system and you have the academic system. And the academic system is for those who are to lead and the professionals and those who are to lead. And then you have the, the um, vocational system, which is for those who are to um, assist those as you lead. Uh, so we still have this system and, and this is where that two-tiered system comes from, that concept. Now, the liberalis, which is the, the curriculum that we grow up with right from, you know, right from early on, uh, is made up of two parts. Uh, again, these are Latin terms. Trivium only means three. And so this is about communication. So in the Greek model, the Athenian model, the, the curriculum was made up of these three, so three topics. So grammar, which is about correctly putting together correctly language. Um, logic, which is putting it in a logical sequence, and um, rhetoric, which is uh, persuasive speech. So it's talking about. So the idea is that you you craft um, your communication in a grammatically correct, logical, and persuasive manner. Okay, is that? And now, anyone? How many of you? Any of you gone to university? Okay. So isn't that that's exactly what you have to do at university? That's because that's where it comes from, the liberal model. So a lot, I used to get frustrated because I'm not a great writer and I'm not detailed. Um, and so, and I, I, I always lose marks because of the way I wrote rather than what I put in there. In because I wasn't able to craft these. Whereas my, my sister who, even at school, she's, you know, she'd do no work until the night before, but she's very good at writing and, and language, would always get high marks because she could, she could craft a really good um, thing. So, so this is this, and they were training the philosopher, the, the communicator. Because remember, how do we find truth? It's by the just the agreement of the most people to the strongest argument. So, for your argument to be heard, you had to be able to um, put it in a grammatically correct, logical, and persuasive way. Okay, so that you could persuade people to your idea. And if you want to counter someone else's argument, again, you have this idea of dialogue, so you can find out what is true. Okay. Basically, so much alike there. That it's written every stage, undergrad, postgrad, doctoral studies. Yeah. It's always about the argument. Yeah. And we'll talk about this later on. But see, once your once your argument is accepted as true, mm -hmm. then you fight to maintain yeah. your your truth, your idea of truth, because there's no absolute truth. So you so you've only got your idea of truth, and so you fight to maintain that. So um, you know, and so you'll ridicule other arguments. So for instance, the argument about climate change. I, I'm not, and I'm not trying to say whether it's right or wrong. Do, do you understand? What I don't like is that now that it's become common, um, you know, truth, through, through the arguments of lots of different, um, different things, anyone who disagrees, at least in our media, is rubbish. You know, anyone who comes up with a counter-argument, even a scientific argument, or says, well, you know, for the last 11 years, there haven't been any there hasn't been a change. In fact, it's decreased. You know, the heat has decreased. And so, all, whatever argument they come up with, it's rubbish because it doesn't align. With, 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 and that's part of protecting truth. You, you see, it's, so we protect. Once we've we've got our truth accepted, we then have to protect our idea of truth through argument, through ridicule, through whatever means we can, because there is no absolute truth. It's all about my idea of truth and trying to protect that. The, the second part of the quadrivium. Um, is um, these three, is, which formalized, there were a couple of others in the earlier days, um, but the Romans formalized it and included these four. And all of them were about training the mind. Okay, so it wasn't to train them to do anything. So that's why you can have someone with a PhD in mathematics who doesn't know how to balance their checkbook. Okay. Wow. Is it, isn't that right? I mean, I, I know people who are genius at mathematics, but man managing finances is not. They can't do that very well, okay? <laughs> because it's not them. So, so it's about theory. It's about. So, give me. I'll give you an example. Um, let me. Here we go. So, here's one object. Can okay, you agree that's one object? Yes. Okay. And this is another object. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. So, one object plus another object equals two, two objects. objects. Two objects. Well done. Okay. So that's called concrete thinking. Okay. Where well, you've got concrete. So, if you go to the preschool, you'll find all sorts of. Um, uh, objects to teach 
children in a concrete manner because at the age of up to about five, is it? Or, that they, or maybe even seven, is it? That they, they're concrete, they, they think concretely. So a child thinks concretely, so they can't learn in an abstract. But eventually, the, and that's why they learn mathematics, is to train them to think in an abstract way. So after you've got one object plus one object equals two objects, that's concrete, we take away the objects, and then we think in an abstract way, one plus one equals two. Okay? And, and so nothing to do with the objects, it's just one and one equals two. And that, that forms a platform of abstract thinking of thinking in the abstract. So that's what mathematics was to do. And all the others, again, were about training the mind. If you read Plato, he, he didn't want, like in music, he said you have to stop performing in public by the time you're 16 uh, because it will affect your pride, your grown pride, and all of these things. And it was, not a, it was about your own personal pleasure and your own personal development, your own personal thinking, because you were creating, uh, the goal was not to create someone who could do anything, but who, who was a thinker. Now I'm being a little bit, um, but they had to stop which, performing? They had to mm. stop? They would stop performing in public around 16 or 15, 16. And so the, the next level would perform in public for everyone, like the, the, the immigrants, but the, the, but the elite, they, that was not their role. They were not entertainers, they were leaders. So they could, they could play for their own amusement, but they couldn't play in public. That, that wasn't their job. Uh, are you talking about that as far as occupation goes? They are not to... Well, their occupation was as a leader, so they, but even, in, yeah. so even as a... Like, even like, if you play an instrument in our culture, if everyone's sitting around, um, you know, you might give a public performance, but if you enjoy it and you're good, they weren't they were allowed to do that, because it, was, it that wasn't their role in society. Similar to Korean culture. Is it? Okay. They used to look down at musicians. Okay, and, okay. so a similar sort of thing. So even though, um, but you, but you're even, but most people would still learn an instrument, wouldn't they, or not? Yeah. Not anymore. Modern day, you know, it's you know. But previously, they yeah, would still learn an instrument. Like yeah. That. Okay. So a similar sort of idea that that it's, you know, and that's where we get some of these ideas from, okay, of, of hierarchies and all of that comes from some of this thing. So I don't want to spend a long time on this, but it is a, it is as a teachers you need to understand where this where the thoughts come mm -hmm. from so that you know and can adjust your own thinking and reading. Okay. So, trivium is about strong argument, the rest is about training the mind, and all of it is about equipping people to know, not do. Now, the Greeks created the, the curriculum, but the Romans, and, and their, their model of education in the, in the earlier days was very similar to the um, Hebrew model, it's about talking, didactic, arguing, um, all of those sorts of things. But the Romans were, they were brilliant at um, setting up systems. Okay, they were very efficient, they were very good at systems, and so they created, um, as far as I can understand, the system of learning, of sitting in a classroom, strong discipline. They, the, the Romans had what were called the 12 laws, uh, which they had to learn, which was the formed the, the basis of their society. So the, the guy was in charge and, ch and talked about the ownership of, of his wife and how that worked, the ownership of children, ownership of property. Um, so the 12 laws laid out how the society was to function. Okay? Um, and that, that for, so in, whereas in, Hebrew, in, in um, Greek society, normally often the society decided um, who would live or die. In Roman society, the father decided whether children or child would live or die. It was a republic. Um, well, it wasn't to begin with, but yes, the whole right the way through, um, it became a republic, and yes, and then became the empire, the Roman Empire, which um, you know, took over most of the known uh, world. And right throughout the empire, the father had the right of life and death over to have children. And so if, you, if the father kids killed a child, um, it was not considered murder, it was just considered his right to do so. That's what the 12 laws did. Contained and showed, it gave the right to the father uh, over the children and over the wife and over those sorts of, you know, property and all of those sorts of things and what they could do. So, so the Romans, they created the classroom that was very efficient, it was very effective, and they've used the rod, a strong discipline, 
and the Romans were very strong on discipline and things. That's not saying there wasn't discipline in the old, te uh, you know, in the Hebrew model and whatever we you know, read in there. You know, spare the rod, spoil the child. But there were, you know, so so there obviously was a normal part of culture and life. But the idea of putting it into a classroom and the harsh discipline, the teacher at the front, all of that came from the Roman model. Um, the Hebrew model was it was in the parents and the community it was much more relational than. Um, than it was in the Greek or the Roman Greek model. Uh, the Greek model was also more relational, and then it became the, the, the Romans um, systematized it. What they say is that the Romans conquered the Greeks. So what you had was the Greek Empire. Any, have you heard of Alexander the Great? Yes. Okay. So you had you had um, Socrates was the first philosopher who mm -hmm. trained uh, Plato who trained Aristotle, and Aristotle was the tutor for um, Alexander. Okay, so, so the thinking came right through, and then Alexander conquered the world in a very short time and died quite young. I can't remember how old he was, maybe in his 30s, I have in my head. Um, yes. But he was quite a young man when he died. Uh, and so, uh, but all of, so all of the known world had become the Hellenistic or Greek Empire. And so the Romans then, became powerful and they eventually took over the Greek Empire and conquered the Greek Empire as well as lots of other places. Uh, but what was said is that although the Romans conquered the Greeks physically, the Greeks conquered the Romans intellectually. Okay? <laughs> so the, the Greek model of education was, it was taken up by the, he, uh, by the Romans and systematized and went throughout the whole. And so that whole idea of Greek thinking um, then permeated the whole of the world, that idea of um, there is no truth and argument and, and rhetoric and, and, and training for thinking. So that became the curriculum um, everywhere. The liberal, and if anyone has heard of liberal arts, liberal, it's a liberal curriculum. Now I'm not going to spend a lot more time on this, I'm going to go, kind of go forward a bit, but it went through the Roman Empire, just for your own interest, was split um, in two. There was the Eastern Empire and the Western Empire. The um, Eastern Empire was governed from Constantinople, Western Empire from Rome, and the church was also, it became formalized uh, about the end of um, about 300 and something, I'm sure I've got it up there. Uh, it became the state religion. It was legalized at the beginning of the 300s, the fourth century. Uh, it became legal to be a Christian. Before that, it was illegal. And at times it would be persecution and all those sorts of things it became legal at that point. And then at the end of the fourth century, it became um, the state religion. So if you were a Roman, you were expected to be a Christian. Okay. So that was, um, and that then entered into the um, into the Middle Ages, which where the church had dominance over society for good and for bad. Uh, the, the, the split also. Um, occurred the, the um, Roman Empire was conquered by the Germans and the Eastern Empire eventually was conquered by the Turks in okay, 1400 or something. Uh, the Western Church or the Roman Church or the Roman Catholic Church which is where the Protestant churches come from was part of the Western Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire which is where Orthodox Christianity comes from um, was, was part of that um, Eastern uh, block. So, so that, and they coexisted, there were five patriarchs, I won't go into all of the history of the church, but um, your five patriarchs, they eventually um, went their own way for both political and theological reasons um, around, well they started quite early on, you know, in the late millennia, eventually at the beginning of the second millennia. Okay, I won't go into that. If you want to copy this, you want to Okay, so I went through the Middle Ages, universities were created. Um, we won't, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. If you want more, we can. Okay, went through. So then coming out of the Middle Ages, we had the Reformation. Okay, so the Reformation was. Um, the Middle Ages were quite a. Uh, like, in some ways, the church controlled everything, and the only education um, really was handled by the church. The Reformation reacted to that, and there was a freedom that came, there was a re-engagement coming out of the Crusades, um, where they began to engage with other people. There was a re-introduction um, of Greek 
for, um, Greek and Roman um, literature and philosophy of education and all of those sorts of things. Okay, so that went, went through the Reformation. Um, then it came to the Reformation. The big thing about the Reformation in terms of education is this is where university, the concept of universal literacy came from. It came from the Reformation. Okay, that everyone, back in the um, days, the, the Hebrews were actually quite illiterate people. Okay, they were quite, um, a lot of them were able to read and write. You can see that even in, um, not everyone, but a lot of them were able to read and write. Uh, coming forward, that got lost. And then in the, uh, when the Reformation came, it was around where the authority, um, Christian authority came from. At that point, the church said, we are the authority. And they were the only ones who had you know, the Bible. You, you couldn't just go down the street and buy a Bible. It was all scrolls and you know, it was all complicated. So they were the holder of truth. Okay? They, so they were the ones who held truth. And they decided what was true and what wasn't true. And they communicated that. So truth was held by the church. With the Reformation, they said, no, that's not right. The Bible holds the truth, and that's the ultimate authority. The Bible's the authority, not the church. Um, and there were lots of other things, obviously, that happened as well. Uh, and so, at that same time, the, the um, Gutenberg Press was developed, and so they were able to make the Bible readily available to people. And so, it was encouraged in most of the Protestant states that people learned to read. And so, you ended up with almost... 100% literacy in places like Scotland and Geneva and all of these places for the purpose of reading the Bible. And, the, and as we as societies get away from a desire to read the Bible, our literacy rates will drop, and they are. In America, Australia, these countries. Our, our literacy, it doesn't matter how much money they throw at it, it doesn't matter what they do, our, liter, our literacy will drop um, unless there's a resurgence of a desire to get to know the Bible and to read the Bible. It's the only reason that, that creates a purpose for a university literacy. Okay, so let's keep going. Okay, so the Reformation, we've talked about that. Uh, liberal education. Okay, so it came through the Greeks, and then the Enlightenment. This is, this is where really our more modern education comes from, the Enlightenment. Okay, now do we need to stand up, or are you kind of falling asleep? Anyone, anyone need to, do you need to stand up and get a bit of, Walk up. Why don't we stand up for a minute? And just, uh, we've been over an hour and we're sitting walking. So stand up, stretch, see if you can touch the ceiling. It's probably a bit of a challenge in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> but see if you can. Stretch as high as you can. See if you can touch the ceiling. See if you can touch your feet. Touch me. See if you can touch the ceiling. No, don't, 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 no, 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 no. We don't want everyone touching the ceiling. <laughs> that wouldn't be good. Okay. So, okay. Put your arms like this. Give yourself a hug, give yourself a hug, big hug. You're a wonderful person. Tell yourself how much, you, oh. how wonderful you are. Oh. oh, you're a great person. You look fantastic today. Thank you. Gifted, oh. talented. I try. Amazing. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Now, one of the reasons you do this, by the way, if you're doing exercise, the Koreans have a really good exercise program. Tell me about it. <laughs> okay. Well, they have a program that they do at school. And regular. Is that, do you still do that? Do you have a little program that you go through? <laughs> yeah. 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 So, look, guys, we've got the next break, we'll do that. Yeah. It's, it's actually, okay, can we sit down for a minute? Yeah, it's actually a really well thought out program. And it, you cross over like this and different things. Yeah. Like yeah. And part of, part of crossing over is important because. They see them as less civilized. Okay, that's their, that's their, um, and they come to this idea that they have not yet been enlightened as the, as the Europeans have. Okay, and that's where the Enlightenment comes from. It's the Enlightenment movement was about enlightening people so that they would see the world as the obviously very enlightened uh, Europeans saw the world. Uh, and so, the aim of the Enlightenment, the, the idea was that you created an educated person. Now, an educated person was trained in the liberal curriculum and was able to dialogue um, effectively about poetry and art and 
military endeavors and re religion and politics and they were able, they were an educated person so they were, you know they knew about Plato and Aristotle and they could quote different things and, and they were an educated person as opposed to an uneducated uh, less civilized person <coughs> that was being encountered in their own societies but also in the societies they came across they called that's why they called the, the African continent the dark continent because it hadn't been enlightened it was unenlightened, it was dark, it was lesser. Unfortunately, at the same time, we had Darwin telling everyone that, um, that the, the evolutionary process, and that caused even more pain in my own country. Uh, uh, it was horrid. Uh, you know, they, they would take, I mean, they killed many, many Aboriginal people, saying that they were not yet human, which is, you know, makes me sad to think that it's horrible. And they would take their skeletons um, and put them in museums all over the world as, as one of the missing links and wow. things like that. Just horrible stuff. And, and that, that's the outcome of Darwinian thinking. Not based on the Bible, based on, see, because he said that the he gave access to that sort of thinking because he said, I've talked about the evolutionary process. And so when you take, see, when you don't have an absolute truth, you have dialogue and discussion creating truth. You then end up with all sorts of ideas that lead in the wrong direction. Okay. So if you have absolute truth, even if God used an evolutionary process, and I'm not trying, so I don't want to get into that debate, even if he did use an evolutionary process, he also shows very clearly that every every human is to be valued and everyone, so he, so it would counter some of those other thinking, which allowed um, wholesale slaughter all over the place. It was, it was yeah, horrible. Um, but that was right across Europe. Okay, it wasn't just the British, it was everyone had the same idea. Um, and so enlightened people, so an educated person had this rounded education, was able to take their place in society, and the goal of engaging with Africa and some of these other countries was to try and enlighten them. Um, yeah. uh, there were all sorts of other things. There was the influence of um, Emile, um, who we, we can talk about a meal. Um, was that uh, was Rousteau? Uh, what's that, Rousteau? Rousseau. Rousseau. Thank you. Rousseau. So Rousseau wrote right, book a meal, but his whole philosophy, which he took from someone else, was that humans are a blank blank sheet of paper. Children are born a blank sheet of paper ready to be written on. And so his philosophy was that um, the problems in the world are because. Uh, Society has written on those on those blank pieces of paper and wrongly, and so religion has done that. Uh, society has done that, and so therefore we need to create a a, a valueless society um, environment because children on their own in their own place will develop naturally if we take out these outside influences. Uh, so and a lot of our education came from that, but also some of the philosophies that have caused all sorts of problems in society. In our country, um, Aboriginal children would be put in um, homes, taken away from their parents with the idea that if they grew up in a, in a different environment, they would not be they would be enlightened and not unenlightened like they, you know, because they're a blank page. So anyway, all sorts of horrible things happened all over the world because of ideas that didn't have a, didn't come from a biblical framework. Often, like any, any, you know, the, the worst lie um, is the lie that's almost true. Do, do, do you understand? That, those are the ones that are the most powerful. And the devil's an expert at lies. That's his language. Those have lied to us. So the idea of liberal education was by educating people, society will be transformed into places of enlightenment, and it finds itself in Greek thinking. Now, if the liberal model of education, this is what we want to going to spend the rest of today and tomorrow on. If the liberal model of education is about educating people, uh, see, the problem with this is this. What happens if you educate a thief? Anyone? What happens if you educate a thief? Do they stop stealing? No. no. What, what happens? What if it, let's do a mathematical equation. Thief plus education equals? Thief Educated thief, yes, education, <laughs> so thief education, <laughs> exactly, okay? What happens if you've got a corrupt politician and you educate them? Corrupt. Educate a corrupt politician, you've got the idea. You, you, 
Because education doesn't change the heart, it just, and that's the whole Greek idea. It, it changes the mind. And the, the mind, you, you've not got your, your belief tree here. It's not your mind that drives you. It's your beliefs, it's your character, it's, there's more to it than that. So, most of our education is about, edu it comes from this liberal model, and it's about educating people's mind. It's all about what you know. But the Greeks created this because they didn't know what truth was. They, they had to debate truth. They created a separation between what you know and what you do. So just because you know something, whereas there was no separation before that. So therefore, the, when, when Jesus came along, he said, not only are you to love me with all your mind, all your, I mean, with all your heart, with all your soul and all your strength, but you're also to love me with all of your mind. Because the Greeks had separated the mind from the whole being. The mind had been had taken a higher place. Yeah. But uh, sorry, I think no, no, that's fine. Right. Good. Ask this. Like you say about the Greek and stuff, they are about the mind and stuff. How come why is the whole world going to be like Hebrew? <laughs> Well, because everyone adopted the Greek, because it was seen that the philosophers were, that there was a, a romanticism of the philosophers. And so all of, um, because the, the world really rejected, and that's what happened. Um, so, so right through, so the Greeks, as I say, they, I mean, the Greeks conquered the Romans intellectually. And so their model and their curriculum then became the curriculum that came all the way through, um, only for the elite. So, so right through until, until the Reformation, only the elite leaders of society were educated. Anyway. Okay? And so maybe the Greek model works for it, for the elite. I don't know. I can't. I, I think there's more than that. But I think they need more. And I think it's part of it is that they saw us alive that then they better knowledge to know the, the, the Latin name for fish than to know what fish are good to eat. Do, 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 you know? And so any, you go to any community in the islands, they know what fish are good to eat, but they may not know the Latin name. Well, the person who knows the Latin name, that, that information would be seen as higher education than knowing what... It's, it's a value. Do, do, does that... you see? Yeah. Okay, so that's... So, and it's, so it's, it, was a, it was an arrogance we love to feel like we know stuff to be elite so the elite then propagated their own that own that own without meaning to necessarily um, the same philosophy so for me this is this is a question we want to answer and there's always been lots of within that framework there's been lots of movements towards lots of other things from lots of wonderful educators so I'm not trying to say everything's bad I'm rushing through in a very quick way to kind of give a either or, it's really not like that. Your life isn't like that. So there have always been wonderful people who have done wonderful things. And if you take, even if you take some of the, you know, people like um, Rousseau and things, there, is, there are elements that are helpful in what he taught, but there are elements that have also been very destructive. Um, so if education doesn't work, that's not the goal. What should the goal be of Christian education? Now, what should the goal be in our schools? And see, this was my question. I, once I saw this, I said, okay, what, what's, what are we meant to do if we're not meant to educate kids? Uh, yeah, but what, what's the, there's a word. And so that's what I, I agree. It's a relationship. It's all of these things. But what I came up with was our YWAM word. Okay. What our goal is is to disciple children, not just educate them. Coming from Matthew, see, it doesn't say in Matthew 28:18, at least not in my Bible. It doesn't say go into the, all the world and educate the nations. Okay, what does it say to do? Make disciples of the nations, not educate the nations. You see, and there's a there has to be a difference. And discipleship, I think, has to do with the whole person. It's about our character. It's about um, what we do. It's what we know. It's about all of us. Um, it's discipling us for, for 
um, we'll introduce this later, but it, it, to disciple us for fullness, not to educate us for success. Do, do you see? And we'll talk about the difference as we, as we go through this. But discipleship, I'll just repeat that. Discipleship um, prepares us for fruitfulness. Whereas education, in, its, in, its, you know, in the sense that we're talking about, um, prepares us for success or tries to develop success. And um, I, I would rather have a fruitful life than a successful life. See. And again, almost it comes back to what we started this morning with. See, the Bible doesn't tell us how to be successful, it tells us how to be fruitful. Now, to me, that is success. Do you, do you, do you understand? But in terms of how the world would see success, the Bible says this is how you can have a fruitful life. Okay? Now, it's not going to be a you-centered life, it's going to be a God-centered life. And that's how life is full of... of full. Mm. You know? My life is full as I give to my wife and my kids and to those around me. It's not as I look at them and say, what can you give to me? You see, success says it's all about me. Me being successful, me having a, um, you know, a pretty wife, me having a Ferrari. Yeah, Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> I lowered my expectations later on. I wanted a Fiat. But, <laughs> but do, do, do you understand? Exactly. So it's not about me having a Ferrari. Um, that's not going to make me happy. It's not going to give me a fulfilled life made for a, a, a minute. Um, um, let me, we're going to have a break in a minute. Let me just give you one more divergent little thought. Um, I, I've got a friend who's an architect. A number of years ago, we were looking, talking about architecture and biblical architecture. And he was saying, he said, well, he said, there, he, he just read a book, and I still haven't been able to find the book, but I love the concept. And he said that the um, architecture and it would be the same with cars and all of these things that we think make us successful um, they do not um, they do not bring contentment they do not bring um, they do not bring life to us um, and they don't bring satisfaction they only minimize our dissatisfaction so having a fancy house or a fancy it will minimize our dissatisfaction okay? it makes us less dissatisfied but it doesn't bring satisfaction. Now, it might, when we've just built the new house, we think, oh, look at this. It might give us satisfaction to start with, but it doesn't take long. Anyone who's lived in a lovely house will know that it doesn't take long, and you become, you know, minimizes your dissatisfaction. It doesn't, doesn't make you satisfied. You know, if any of you know people who have fans, you know, it's not long, and they, if they've got money, and they want to redecorate because they're dissatisfied, you know. You think, well, that looked okay to me. <laughs> why are you in your kitchen? You know, why are you? Because it doesn't bring satisfaction. It just lessens the dissatisfaction. Whereas other things bring satisfaction. Things like relationship, achieving goals. You know, the things that are, make a fruitful life, they bring satisfaction and joy and happiness to our life. The others are only temporal. You know, I get my new Ferrari and I think, look at me. I drive down the road and hoping everyone's looking at me and thinking how wonderful I am. And, you know. And then I see someone in a fancier car, and I think, oh, I want that one now. You know, I'm going to become dissatisfied. It lessens my dissatisfaction. You, you, you know, or, or I get a 10-year-old Ferrari, and I'm, I'm driving down the road, because that's all I can afford, and someone drives up with a brand new one. And you go, oh, you know, I thought I was done. You know, because it only lessens, it doesn't bring satisfaction. You know, um, you know, sexual relationships outside of God, they don't, they lessen the dissatisfaction, they don't bring satisfaction, they don't, uh, you know, when, when it's right context and it recreates intimacy and relationship and it develops a, a greater relationship in its right place, you, you, you see, and it brings satisfaction in a relationship, but it does it outside of that. So all of the things we can, we can long for and think, you know, God's just stopping us having fun, God puts protection so that it builds a fruitful and satisfied and wonderful life. That's it. For eternity and, and for now as well. It's both. See, that's that's the that's it says my kingdom come on earth. And so living God's kingdom on earth is going to be the best place you can be. It's going to bring the most fulfillment, the most joy, the most life. Our relationships are, and you know what I find, as I say, that the two things that or two of the two of the main things that bring satisfaction are um, achieving goals. And relationships. 
with, with God and with others. Those are probably the two. Uh, I mean, there's other things within that, but they, those are the kind of the, there's other things as well, but they're two of the key, two of the many things. And so it's um, for me. Uh, often, what you find is one. Some people are much more down this end. That's what satisfies them. They they love relationship with other people, with God. They'll spend hours. My wife's more like that. Uh, whereas me, I'm, I'm more. I, I enjoy relationship, and I've learned to enjoy it more and more. But I also really like achieving goals and you know, getting goals achieved. Uh, and you can be. You, you tend to be towards one end or the other of that um, spectrum. We all want both because both bring satisfaction. Uh, and, and I think as we go through life, we learn to enjoy both uh, as part of um, yeah coming to a full. Okay, let's take a break. What time do you want to come back? Uh, 15 minutes, only. Okay, so about quarter two. Let's be back here ready to go at quarter two. Yeah. So, oh, don't forget the 10 pounds. <laughs>